Kopinski, and I was asked to talk on the question, are heart and lung interactions clinically relevant? The answer to that is, of course, yes, but I will show you the data. These are my conflicts of interest, and they do not relate to this presentation. Let's start with the fundamental reality. Breathing is exercise, and the number of studies that have shown that breathing puts an increase in cardiovascular stress on human beings is too numerous to mount. If you have a person in heart failure and you're trying to screen them off ventilation, they have got ischemia as shown by a fall in the PHI, whereas normal people would not have a form of gut acidosis. The people who eventually fail start off on the ventilator with a low value, but it goes down to thing, levels of gut pH that are so low, they're equivalent to cardiogenic shock. Similarly, um, Amal Gibran showed that in the weaning, weaning success people could increase their cardiac output such that their mixed venous O2 sat did not change, whereas people who could not maintain enough blood flow to make the metabolic demands of exercise associated with weaning had a progressive decrease in SVO2 to levels significantly similar to those of hemorrhagic or septic shock. Exercise is the limitation. It is the big fish. Weaning is also a cardiovascular stress test. If people have a great work cost of breathing, it's been shown in numerous studies that they develop LV dysfunction and then myocardial infarction. One of the prettiest studies was done many years ago by Francois Lemaire and the group at Crité with uh, Jean-Louis Taboul. And what they did is take COPD patients and put them on the ventilator. And what you can see here is when they were breathing spontaneously, their esophageal pressure became negative and they had profoundly negative swings in intrathoracic pressure as they struggled to breathe. By nine minutes, they were having angular respirations. But if you look at the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, it started around, around 18 or so. But at five minutes in, it went up to 20, I'm sorry, to 40, which is very, very high and up to 45, which is not compatible with life. And at the very end where you see the pressure falling, I asked Francois, what happened? And he said, we had to put the patient back on the ventilator or they died. This means that the spontaneous breathing trial will manifest itself as failure to breathe secondary to exercise exox exhaustion very quickly, and you should not leave the bedside during such a trial. So now let's skip over on the hemodynamic effects of ventilation on changes in lung volume or changes in intrathoracic pressure. If you hyperinflate the lungs or make them very small, they will change their vascular resistance. We can consider that the lung is perfused by vessels that have different outside pressures. They're either alveolar or extraalveolar vessels. The alveolar vessels sense alveolar pressure as their outside pressure and the extraalveolar vessels sense interstitial or pleural pressure. And remember that the difference between alveolar and pleural pressure is a transpulmonary pressure. They all have the same internal pressure in the vasculature. So as lung volume gets bigger or smaller, the transpulmonary pressure gets larger or smaller proportionately. And if it gets greater than the pressure inside, the vessels will collapse. So one can look at pulmonary vascular resistance relative to residual volume functional residual capacity or total lung capacity. And like a lot of things in the world, it's a U-shaped curve with the lowest vascular resistance at FRC. But you'll note when you look at alveolar resistance, it's very small because alveoli have no vasculature. But as the lungs get bigger and bigger, the transpulmonary pressure exceeds pulmonary artery pressure and the alveolar vessels spontaneously collapse and their cross-sectional area decreases so much that pulmonary vascular resistance goes up. This is the cause of pulmonary hypertension in chronic obstructive lung disease patients with hyperinflation. But if we go the other way and look at the extra alveolar vessels, when volume gets smaller and smaller, the alveoli collapse down, the terminal airways close, and I get hypoxia. And by the process of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, pulmonary vascular resistance goes up. So, if I decrease lung volume, as Hakim showed, loss of elastic recoil, I get an increase in resistance. And if I overdistend the lungs, I collapse them because the transpulmonary pressure causes the alveoli to collapse. So PEEP only increases lung volume. So as Canada from the late Dr. Sibyl's lab showed that if you had two lungs, you increase in lung injury in one with the lake acid and let the other be normal, and you just looked at the effects of PEEP, let's look at the acute lung injury lung. 
if you added PEEP, you got a slight decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance with the PEEP. And that was almost assuredly recruitment of collapsed LVLI. And then you can see at 10, nothing much happens. And they go at 15 and 20, it goes higher. Contrast that to the normal lung, where there's a slight but not statistically significant decrease in the resistance at five, but as you progressively increase the lung volume, its resistance goes up. And you can see there's absolutely nothing different between the healthy and the diseased lung once they're open. The higher, the, once they're open, the higher the PEEP, the higher the resistance. And this is important for conditions such as COVID, where we have normal compliance of the lung. Higher levels of PEEP will merely overinflate the lungs. Hyperinflation is profoundly common. And as John Marini and Pepe showed in their original paper on it, if you just simply take a patient with chronic obstructive lung disease off the ventilator and allow them to deflate, their cardiac output goes up from 2.6 to 4.3 as their wedge pressure and esophageal pressure decrease. The other thing that happens with increases in lung volume is it compresses the heart. The chest wall can go up, the diaphragm is compliant. Uh, can go down, but the heart is trapped in the cardiac fossa and it must get smaller. And indeed, that was nicely shown in Seattle by the study on ARDS patients in the CT scanner in which they measured their lung volumes on a cross-sectional view at expiration and inspiration of zero PEEP. And I just want to show you this. When you go to 10 of PEEP, look at how much smaller the heart is. Okay, and this is because of decreased venous return and compression of the heart by the increased intrathoracic pressure. This must decrease preload and cardiac output. So let's look at the effects of intrathoracic pressure on the heart. And to do that, we just have to make a simple assumption, and that is the heart is within the chest, a pressure chamber inside a pressure chamber, and thus increases and decreases in intrathoracic pressure must affect the pressure gradient for venous return. So looking at systemic venous return, as you know, the relationship in right atrial pressure and flow shows that in you and I, there's an equilibrium point that is due to a balance of ventricular pump function and venous return. And then during positive pressure breathing, you see that the increase in intrathoracic pressure by increasing right atrial pressure causes venous return to fall. And that would be described in this fashion here. And what people normally do if they intubate a patient for surgery is they then give them fluid so that their venous return curve comes up. But as we saw with Francois Lemaire's group, if you now take that person and extubate them and allow intrathoracic pressure to fall, they will flood their lungs with increasing venous return. Andre Deneau documented the changes in venous return that occurred very nicely with positive pressure breathing in man. As you can see here, looking at the left ventricular area using echo, that there was a profound decrease in preload associated with this fall in venous return. And the greater the tidal volume, the greater the amount of blood that get, leaves the chest during inspiration and comes back during expiration, as Jamie Mosqueda showed in this study in our lab when you go from five to 10 to 15 to 25 ml tidal volumes. Okay. The, the good thing for you and I is that we increase lung volume, we descend the diaphragm and that pressurizes the abdomen. And because of the increased abdominal pressure, this causes the venous return curve to rise. And therefore we mitigate the fall and cardiac output with positive pressure breathing. But consider what happens if you have a person with a, tens a tense of abdomen and you're taking them to surgery and they open up their abdomen. Their cardiac output will fall precipitously and they need fluids immediately because you've just taken away that stent. Now let's talk about the effects of increased intrathoracic pressure on the left ventricle. And for that, we have to figure out what is left ventricular ejection pressure, which is transmural pressure. As we showed years ago, you can consider that the pressure on the left ventricle is equal to the internal pressure in this example in the top 150 over zero. If I simply gave a pure alpha agonist like phenylephrine, I would cause the pressure to go to 200, pleural pressure zero, and everyone would agree that the transmural pressure is 200. But if I had an obstruction and breathed against an occluded airway to a minus 50 millimeters of pressure, and I still had an airway mean arterial pressure of 150, as far as the heart's concerned, that's the same 200 millimeters of mercury pressure. 
So negative swings in intrathoracic pressure increase left ventricular afterload and positive swings unload the left ventricle. And as we showed in this study in the New England Journal, if you have significant strains in the left ventricle, the left ventricle in diastolic goes up a bit, but the right ventricle, the in systolic volume balloons up as it cannot eject against this acute increase in afterload. But in heart failure, with the increase in, uh, decrease in afterload that's occurring with the positive swings, just like nitroprusside, we should be able to improve function. And we would hypothesize that the increase in intrathoracic pressure in severe heart failure would improve outcome. And indeed, that's what we saw in a heart failure model with low tidal volume pressure as we progressively increased uh, intrathoracic pressure, we saw stroke volumes go up. Note that there was an increase in intrathoracic pressure and it caused all intrathoracic volumes to go down because, of course, any increase in intrathoracic pressure decreases venous return. But note that the stroke volumes actually rose. This is analogous to nitroprusside increasing cardiac output. So increases in left ventricular intrathoracic pressure decrease left ventricular afterload. So we could say any relative increase in intrathoracic pressure should decrease left ventricular afterload. So if we simply take away the negative swings in intrathoracic pressure, for example, abolish obstructive breathing, we should immediately decrease left ventricular afterload. And negative swings decrease intrathoracic, negative swings in intrathoracic pressure by increasing afterload cause pulmonary edema. They do it in status asthmaticus, upper airway obstruction, obstructive sleep apnea, and pulmonary edema. And this is the basis for why we are so afraid of these things and just simply in opening the airway with intubation or bronchodilators has profound hemodynamic effects. And CPAP, for example, is the treatment for congestive heart failure. The number of studies that have shown that non-invasive CPAP and BiPAP are the primary therapy for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema and obstructive sleep apnea are too numerous to count. The original ones were published many years ago, and they now become the standard of care in the emergency room and in the ICU. The treatment for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema is CPAP, followed by figuring out why they're in acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, but you immediately have decreased the afterload and improved ventricular function in those patients. So in summary, Heart-lung interactions are present and with us at all times and form the basis of much of the work that we do. Failure to wean from mechanical ventilation often reflects cardiovascular insufficiency. And thus, if you're going to wean a patient, understand that the process of spontaneous breathing must increase intrathoracic fluid content, and thus you want to keep them dry prior to extubation. So therefore you do not extubate a hemodynamically unstable patient because they will not tolerate it. Obstructive breathing of any form will cause pulmonary edema and can lead to death very quickly if it's vocal cord paralysis and a person is young and otherwise has very strong inspiratory muscles. CPAP is the primary therapy for both acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema and obstructive sleep apnea. Never intubate and ventilate a trauma patient without first giving fluids, unless you want to practice your CPR uh, efforts, because you will cause them to immediately crash. This is a common thing that is known in the emergency department, and it really underscores completely the issues that we see in our patients. And with that, I thank you for your attention.